South Africa Global presents. Thank you. So I'm now joined by Madi Jobate. Everyone knows Madi, of course. Madi, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Good it's be been here. a while <laughs> since the, you you last been here. Well, I'm around. Madi, the government is saying they have opened an investigation into the bribery scandal that has rocked the fisheries ministry. I, I've shown you written a couple of times on this issue the fact that. Uh, the Malagan investigation, quite impressive, really, was able to uncover uh, uh, what is really unpalatable in terms of public officials. What is your uh, take on the entire Buruhaha? Well, uh, first of all, to uh, say Malagan did a wonderful job, and ultimately, investigative journalism. Um, is one of the great tools that is going to help this country um, ensure good governance, and that is to make sure um, they, you know, promote transparency and accountability, um, so that uh, we can combat, expose corruption, and combat corruption and, and abuse of office, you know, particularly in the public service. Um, it's four years almost for this government, and this is the first time we have seen the government take a step um, to take action against a public official for corruption. Um, when, in fact, there have been multiple incidents of corruption, um, you know, within the public sector um, that the government has refused to, to deal with. And so th this is a welcome move, but indeed long in the day that we should have seen uh, way back since 2017, uh, government taking action to address corruption, um, you know, by prosecuting public officials who are engaged in corruption and abuse of office. Mm -hmm. um, so, whilst we welcome this, it is important to highlight that there are so many incidents, instances of corruption, uh, for which the government itself said they will open the investigations, and until now, uh, nothing has come of it. Um, you can recall the fertilizer incident at the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, you know, even the Ministry of Fisheries itself, I mean, the entire office complex was burned down. And until now, there's no report to say what investigation has been done. You know, we know of the diplomatic passports. Um, you know, and so, so many other instances, even including a situation where government itself commissioned an investigation into seven state-owned enterprises, uh, which re published its report in, in 2018. And it exposed massive corruption within our public enterprises. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, millions of dollars were spent on that uh, audit report, yet uh, no action has been taken. You know, so um, these things are too many. And for me, what it reflects is that uh, this government is not interested to combat corruption. Um, it is just that um, we've got to a point where this is a very compelling story and the whole public have picked it up. And so government, I, I think, being ashamed, uh, feeling guilty, I mean, um, decided to take this action. But we have to follow uh, whether actually investigation would be done on this issue. And whilst that is going on, it is important to also highlight that the president should have even suspended or sacked his minister for foreign, I mean, for fisheries, where this thing happened. One would have expected that Golden Lead Company itself, as a foreign company involved in the bribery of public officials, would have been immediately suspended, you know, to show that indeed this government is interested to combat corruption, the president in particular. But uh, none of those has happened. And we know, of course, um, at the final analysis, this country has no anti-corruption body. One would have expected, um, given that the hallmark of the Jammer regime was corruption and abuse of office, abuse of power, one of the first institutions to be created in 2017, when this government took over, should be an anti-corruption body. Unfortunately, that body has not been created and it is now four years, and we are still yet to see an anti-corruption body. So that they would have taken this matter to investigate. 
But yes, uh, this story has come out. It's compelling, great, you know, investigative reporting. Uh, there is too much pressure on the government. But as I said, um, you know, Malagan and other media houses have reported other cases of corruption. You know, whether it is sand mining or whether it is, you know, I mean, our national ID cards, you know, whether it's about, um, you know, other forms of businesses, government contracts, yes. you know, in various areas. And all of those things have been ignored by this government. And uh, no society will progress if, if corruption is not tackled. So um, I'm not excited by this action, uh, indeed, even though I welcome it. But I think more than any time, governments need to be vigilant um, to see where it ends. And, and probably this is the time to also uh, raise that issue about the public. Um, it is great we, we have our media doing their best to come and expose issues like this. Mm -hmm. But it is high time the general citizenry of the people uh, of the Gambia realize that ultimately uh, it is us who should make these things happen. Um, I would have expected Gambians would, you know, uh, react in, in a, you know, massive way. Uh, about this issue and many others yes. before uh, that have been brought out by the media so that we put the pressure on the government to ensure that there is accountability. But it is unfortunate in this country uh, when even when we see blatant corruption, uh, blatant abuse of power, abuse of office, police brutality, yes. uh, our citizens still are very dormant, very docile, they, you know, keep yes you know, silent about it. Yes. And that is not going to help even the media. It's not going to even encourage the media. Um, you know, Al Jazeera conducted uh, an investigation into passports in Cyprus. Yes. And they released the report. From last night, the people of Cyprus are standing in before their parliament to protest the massive and these are these are the citizens right yeah that yeah. is different from 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 journalists these yeah. are the citizens yeah. the yeah. journalists where probably where their work would stop yeah. would be to do the investigation yeah. and be done with then yeah. the citizens would have to yeah. pick it up yeah so so it is now citizens who have not been given all the necessary ingredients the information with which we should now use to make or break this country to make this country by standing up to demand that uh, not just at the Ministry of Fisheries and Dr. Banja, but that government go back from 2017, dig out all corruption issues, address all corruption issues, all right, and suspend any public official involved, open investigations, and let the investigation come out and we see action take place. That is how citizens will make this country. But we are going to destroy this country when we have information like this, and we sit there silently, quietly, and even making remarks because I've heard that that these journalists they now want to destroy, you know, uh, Dr. Banja's career. You know, I hear people say that, which is very pathetic. And I, and I think that is one of the problems we have in this country. That is what is called hypocrisy in this country. You see, people so long the person is your friend, and a journalist tries to report on nothing but the truth about the person they see you as an enemy of progress they see you as a liar yeah yeah i mean um which is really uh, unfortunate uh, the the media in the gambia should be commended um and malayan in particular for bringing out all of these issues every day you you bring people here um to us you know serious issues and serious issues emerge here that one would have expected citizens would pick what comes out of this news review uh, to take it further because that's that is the purpose of uh, the media that's the role of the journalists um you know to hold the government accountable and when you do that and citizens get to see uh the issues um it is now for citizens to pick that up to make sure there is justice and accountability um but if we fail to do that and even go further to try to, um, you know, ridicule the media or attack the media um, in favor of uh, perpetrators, 
Um, it means, therefore, um, what we are doing is to entertain a culture of corruption, which we have suffered in this country, uh, which is precisely the, the reason why this country is hapless as it is. Uh, the reason why we cannot have electricity supply 24-7 from end to end of the Gambia, the reason we cannot have water supply, the reason why our streets in our towns and villages are in such a bad shape, the reason why uh, Gambian mothers would die giving birth to a Gambian in our public hospitals it, which are in bad shape, the reason why our public schools uh, lack the necessary materials, um, the reason why our workers like teachers, uh, nurses, doctors, um, even civil servants not paid you know, good salaries, the reason why our economy is in this mess, cost of living is so high, even though we are paying so much higher tax, is for nothing other than corruption. Yeah. Nothing other than corruption. It merely means not only uh, public funds, public resources diverted, but it also means public officials at the highest level across the state are not performing their functions as required by law. So that when we look at public hospitals, what is happening there, or public schools, the question that people need to ask, how much has the president allocated as a budget, estimated a budget for education or health care? How much, uh, that estimate, how much did the National Assembly approve? The executive should have its own mechanisms, accountability mechanisms to make sure all state or public institutions, public officials perform their job well. If you don't perform your job, you should be sanctioned to make sure every bit that is spent, you know, budgeted for health, for education, goes to education. So that from Bandul to Fatoto, if whatever money is allocated for health, how much is going to Fatoto Health Center, to Bansa Hospital, to Farafanya Hospital, or Biam Hospital, or, you know, I mean, Sarakunda Hospital, or to that health center, or this health center, to make sure every boot gets there. That would make sure the necessary resources, equipment are available, so that a Gambian with whatever disease should be able to go to Fatoda Health Center and obtain the highest quality of health service. That's the purpose of our budget. That's why we pay tax. That's why government takes loans and receives grants. So when you look at this country, billions of dollar, dollars are allocated as our budget. We take billions of dollars as loans. We receive billions of dollars as grants. Yet, you go to our foremost public of health center in, in Banjo, you cannot get basic care. Basic drugs are not there. Basic equipment is not available. So where did the money go? You know, you go to our public schools. I mean, go to Serakunda School. Go to Bakau Primary School. Go to Boraba Primary School. Or, you know, Karawan Primary School. And look at the quality, you know, of the environment, of the classroom. That you know this is not a school building fit for human habitation, fit for education. So where is the money when you have billions of dollars allocated to education through loans, through grants from our budget? You, I mean, uh, you, you go to agriculture. I mean, how many projects are in this country? Billions of dollars put into agriculture, yet we cannot feed ourselves. We cannot produce enough food to cater for ourselves. Yet we, and, and we have flat, fertile land, you know, unlimited underground water and rivers and, you know, rainwater and everything. So why cannot we produce ourselves? So, I mean, all of this is not because we are called Gambia or we are in the west coast of Africa or we are black people. No. The only reason is because there is no accountability. And where there is no accountability, what obtains is abuse. Uh, and, and one thing that I've been out there since this government took power, I mean, clearly has to do with the political will to fight corruption. But what we have seen is that in the recent days and weeks, that there was this letter, a decision moved by the president of Sierra Leone, which was uh, widely shared by Gambians online, saying that was, in fact, the first thing President Borough should have done to really prove or show to the Gambian people that he's interested in fighting corruption was to suspend 
every public official who has been you know found wanting in, yeah. in 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 the misuse of public funds do you think this was the, 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 this was the way to go about it yeah so uh one it means uh, president Barrow has no will whatsoever to combat corruption yes and um he doesn't have the will he doesn't have the commitment he doesn't have the values to combat corruption because in the first place, he, one of his first actions is an act of corruption. Um, receiving uh, resources and labeling them anonymous donors. Mm -hmm. Now, anyone who does that, then you are promoting corruption. You are engaging corruption. So, for me, from the very first day, I have seen a president who has no will to combat corruption, but to uh, fertilize corruption, to, to make sure corruption germinates in this country. And this is why his government is hugely corrupt. Now, the Ghana Commission, when it came out, they did a wonderful job. And I would urge Gambians, go and get the reports of the Ghana Commission. I mean, even if you are going to put it in your library. Because they did a marvelous job. Uh, I would refer people to just volume three the section on findings and recommendations and see how public officials um, aided and abetted Jami to open all sorts of bank accounts in all kinds of banks to go and withdraw thousands and millions of dollars just like that when that is not their function and you have these individuals still operating in our government still doing things around so what would I have expected when that uh, Janet Commission report was presented to the president, a president who is committed to combat corruption, to end abuse of office, would have declared first and foremost that anybody mentioned adversely in this report, if you are working in the government, you are hereby suspended. All right? To um, go and clear your name in the courts, and to implement the actions that the government, I mean, the General Commission has recommended in full, yes. not to selectively pick, you know, how to implement that. So it clearly means uh, this government under Barrow is not interested to combat corruption, uh, abuse of power, and uh, that explains what we are seeing in this country until today. So um, apart from bribery cases like this, the fact that uh, a company like Golden Lead can still be operating in the Gambia, damaging our environment in any way you can imagine. I mean, why did the incident in Faraba happen? That three Gambian youths had to die, you know, because you give contracts to foreign and local companies in ways that are dubious, all right? I mean, the Semlex contract, the contract with the EU on, in our fish, uh, I mean, for, for fish resources, I mean, the Banjo Road project. I mean, and many other projects that are taking place now, government contracts, whether it's tourism, not long ago, I mean, the staff of the tourism, Ministry of Tourism or, or GTB, yes. I mean, wrote to the National Assembly to expose massive corruption. And no action was taken. Not long ago, the Minister of um, Health stood on the floor of the National Assembly to say there is massive corruption in his ministry. Yes. Not the National Assembly, not the police, not PMO, not the minister himself took any action to deal with that issue, all right? So these are all issues that uh, are prevailing in this country that, that, that need to be addressed. So, um, but nothing has happened. But and what, one thing clearly, it would appear that the president and his advisors see all of these things as mere speculation. Uh, reason being, I interviewed one of his advisors just two days ago, and what he said is that governments don't operate by speculation. Even after I put to him that, listen, there is an investigation that has happened. It has uncovered massive corruption on the part well, of the government. But they see these things and that, that, that the president doesn't operate by speculation. Well, so clearly, yeah. the president would, would appear is looking at all of these things that we are talking about as just mere speculation. I mean, that is one of the most nonsensical statements an adversary could claim, could make. And for me, that adversary needs to be sacked. Because what, what is speculation here? Really? The government commission uh, se, uh, uh, audit of seven SOEs, they produce a report. What is speculation there? The Minister of Health stood on the floor of the parliament and talked about um, 
corruption. What is speculation there? This Malagan story and many other stories that came highlighted corruption in many sectors. What is speculation there? But if that is speculation, investigate it to prove whether that speculation is right or wrong. So, but, but, and clearly they wouldn't even know how to even go about it. What was also shocking was that even after the government sanctioning an investigation into this scandal, what they did was to reach out to Malagan. Yeah, for Malagan to tell them where they got this information from. Well, you know, that, 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 that shows the incompetence of the government. Um, a newspaper, a journalist, uh, the media exposes corruption, which is compelling. And you as a government open an investigation. That, go, they, they, that media cannot be a source of information for you. Exactly. That information is already published. <laughs> yes. So if anything, you that, is why you that is all. Yeah, that, that is, is it. Yes. So it is for you to now go and do your proper investigation if you are an, 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 a competent, uh, a determined uh, government interested to combat corruption. Yes. So by telling me this, what I, I, you've even raised my doubts now, because by telling me this, what this means is this government wants to play with this case. And tell because, that I mean, what I, if, if I'm to advise Mulligan, I will tell them don't cooperate with them. But Mulligan cannot co simply cannot cooperate with them yeah, because yeah. Mulligans, yeah. they, they, their sources spoke to them yeah. on condition of them being protected. Yeah, yeah. So, so don't Mulligan cooperate cannot, with them do that. because now they want to rely on that to make this a foolish case. All right. But that just exposes more the incompetence of this government. And so, if a presidential advisor should claim these are speculations. That is a nonsensical statement, and that advisor does not deserve to sit in that office anymore. He should be kicked out. All right? I mean, look at the COVID funds. How much money has Ghana government allocated for the combat against COVID? Now you are opening all other places. So where is that money? That COVID money, why, why is it? You've done it's a supplementary appropriation bill over $2 billion. Before that, you've already spent more than $2 billion. I mean, why is all of that money? So uh, it's shameful that a presidential advisor would have no good thinking rather than to sit here to say his government, uh, those uh, issues are speculation. And your presidential advisor, I think if the president has some sense, should realize that this advisor is digging my grave. I should sack this advisor. You as an advisor should help the president to tell the president, hey, look, there is serious issue here. There, is, there are problems here. My advice is take action. Mm -hmm. Then we are helping the president. Mm -hmm. But to sit here before Gambia and deny uh, all of these issues, it means you are not helping the president, you are not helping the government, you are not helping the people of the Gambia. I mean, for me, that advice is nothing more than a, a traitor, a betrayal of Gambians. Because the evidence is compelling. How can you sit here and say that is, a, that is speculation? So it, it's shameful. Well, they, they clearly they, they are saying that the president doesn't operate by speculation. So maybe that is why there is not much commitment that we are seeing. Away from that, let's talk about the uh, fumbled draft constitution. I mean, clearly you expressed your disappointment when it, it, it failed to pass the National Assembly test. Um, what do you have to uh, say about the fact that the MPs were not happy and then they threw it out? No, th those who voted against the draft constitution um, did not vote because they are unhappy, because there is a problem with the draft constitution. They voted against it purely to protect uh, selfish personal interests. And that is very tragic. What uh, do you for, mean by uh, that? Um, for example, when you speak about uh, the time limit, you will not accept a time limit that starts in 2017. You are clearly uh, fronting for uh, the current president. And if you are a Gambian, a human being, uh, and we state in our draft constitution, no Gambian should uh, govern, lead this country for more than 10 years. I think every decent Gambian should accept that that is a rule that should apply to all. So for anyone to claim that a one Gambian should be able to do more than 10 years uh, is a huge insult to the whole of Gambia, to our sovereignty as a republic, as, as citizens. And, you know, clearly it only shows that one is only there to serve personal, selfish, political interests. All right. So 
all of the issues that have been raised to counter this draft constitution are unfounded. For example, the draft, I mean, the time limit, as I said, but also, I mean, the complaints about the salary of judges or the benefits of judges. You go and pick the Ghana constitution right now, or the Serenian constitution right now, or the Nigeria constitution right now. You would see they, these are basic um, standards in terms of the benefits of judges mm -hmm. in any country you go. All right? The idea that the National Assembly is more powerful, is o o over powerful, I mean, it's an outrageous idea. But the National Assembly is the heart of our governance and development. Because the National Assembly is that structure, that power, yes. that checks across society. Yes. So it needs to have all the necessary powers and tools and resources to check the executive particularly. And the powers that are in the National Assembly, I mean in the uh, draft constitution, there are no powers different from what you would find in the constitution of Ghana or Sierra Leone or Nigeria or those other democracies that have been there longer than us. Yes. So it is utterly unfounded yes. to claim that the National Assembly has more, has overwhelming powers. No. The powers they have are legitimate, adequate powers that any National Assembly in a democratic republic should have. So clearly, uh, those who voted against this National Assembly, for me, uh, they want to kill the Gambia because uh, we recognize that we did an election in 2016 purposely uh, to remove a dictatorship uh, which has created a constitution uh, that is really inadequate to provide democratic governance in the country. And that is a key objective of the coalition that took over to ensure that there is utter system change. Now, the draft constitution has provided all of the uh, foundations, the pillars, the tools, the processes for creating that system change. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, mm -hmm. from the 1997 constitution. Yeah. So any Gambian who is interested in the making, in the building of the new Gambia, should embrace the draft constitution. And these National Assembly members who voted against it, they just stood against Gambia's national interest. And this is really serious because in the Constitution, Section 112, that is the 1997 Constitution, it has established the values, the standards upon which National Assembly members shall perform their functions in the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. It says National Assembly members, in the execution of their functions in the National Assembly, shall be guided by only their conscience yes. and the national interest. Yes. And I mean, when we talk about conscience, conscience is right, conscience is just, conscience is good. So if the National Assembly, if I'm a National Assembly member, you are in that house, you should think according to your conscience. And your conscience would have told you that we need this draft constitution. You see. So for me, it is a huge betrayal uh, that they attempted to distort, to, you know, um, misinterpret, I mean, to um, exaggerate, to generate fear uh, around the draft constitution as a terrible document. No. That is all a game to divert people's attention from their objective, which is to protect, to promote uh, selfish political objectives. And this is how we got to say it. And they have really set this country back. Because it means from henceforth, what we have now is the 1997 constitution. That's what we are going into with into the national assembly, I mean, in the presidential elections that are to come. And um, will this government have the will uh, to bring another constitution, to set in motion another constitution building process, uh, which is going to produce a constitution that will be better than this uh, draft constitution or not? Will we uh, accept that again? All right? And this is the reason why some of us have argued that national assembly members, just like the executive, should not touch. Exactly. Draft I, I was going to ask you that. Don't you think you made matters complicated? You know, you confuse the MPs there when you say they have no right at all to touch the document. No. Um, you know, I, I, um, you, you see, we are not here to beg National Assembly members or to beg you or me as citizens in the, for in, you know, in the affairs of this country. We've got to call the spade the spade. It is National Assembly members when the executive brought that bill for the uh, uh, CRC 
to kickstart that constitutional building process and to create a structure for the writing of that constitution, a bill was brought before them. They looked at the bill and then they approved it. And the whole idea of the CRC was to go to Ghanaians and seek their opinion because this constitution, like any constitution for any country, determines how we live in this country. How we live in this country, nobody has the authority to determine that other than the people themselves. Not the president, not the National Assembly, not the judges, not you or me as individuals. It's the government people who should determine that process. I mean, how we live in this country. And that is captured in our constitution. So it is a beautiful process we began to set up a TRC. We did a, a, a very good consultative work to go around Gambians at home and abroad, mm -hmm. and even meet National Assembly members as a body of its own. So that uh, given the political and the legal basis for that process, it is just evident, natural, that uh, no, when the draft, final draft is done, sent to the president and the president sent it to the National Assembly, that nobody removes a word or a comma from it. That the National Assembly would have exercised restraint because even if they said, okay, we will rely on the constitution of the Gambia, that we have a right to touch any bill that comes before us. The constitution is not making it a requirement that you have to touch it. You can also say, no, I'm not going to touch this. You will not harm the constitution. So they should have exercised restraint, bearing in mind the legal and the political basis for this process, that we should not touch this because uh, this is the opinion of all Gambians, and we have no authority to change the opinion of Gambians, and they pass it to a referendum. Right? But you can see uh, the uh, disingenuity, the selfishness of those norms who voted against by voting against when they claim they have a right, a constitutional authority to touch the bill. Now, why don't you then touch the bill and edit it than to outright no? It means you have an agenda because you don't even want to discuss it. Yeah, if I have a right to touch this document, then, and I'm interested in national interest, mm -hmm. I'm driven by my conscience. Certainly, they don't speak about every provision in that draft constitution. So they don't have a problem with every provision in that constitution. Yes. So those issues you have problems with, if you believe you have a right constitutional authority to touch it, then go to your committee mm -hmm. and look at those provisions and change them. Then you can tell me, okay, you are a man and a woman of goodwill, that you are interested in national interest, that you are driven by conscience. But if you refuse to touch it, but you said no, then you have an agenda. And uh, for me, that is what they have demonstrated, that they have an agenda. But for me, I think, uh, if anything, uh, it is our error as a people, I think as Gambians, we should have all stood our ground from the very beginning, that not no National Assembly member touch our draft constitution. Because um, it is our opinion. It is how we decide how we live in this country. Yes. Do you, recognize, do, you, do you realize that some of those MPs that voted down the draft, what they are saying is that their people said they should go there and then vote against it? Do you realize yeah. that? Well, yeah, I've These are people that are representing entire constituencies. No, yeah, no, no, I think that is false. Because I challenge each of those MPs who voted against the draft to give evidence where they held a town hall meeting in their constituency, or a radio program in their constituency, or a rally in their constituency, or any meeting in their constituency, to, really to, to show us this meeting was talking about uh, touching or voting against this draft constitution. I challenge any MP, National Assembly member, who has voted against it on the basis that my people told me so, to give evidence. Yeah. yeah, so I'm making this public challenge public to all challenge National to Assembly all members yes. who voted against it to uphold your integrity, to uphold your willingness to uphold national interests, to I mean, uh, prove that you are driven by your conscience. Show us in pictures and videos 
Or oh, even in I minutes. Are those MPs that don't have constituencies, but yet they voted against. <laughs> against <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, the disaster <laughs> in the first place. We should never have had any MP in the parliament who was voted by the people. Yeah. But that is even more scandalous, because if if you are nominated, um, yeah. you know, to be in the national assembly, you should take that my constituency is the whole of the Gambia. You know, before you take any decision, if I nominated member, if you cannot be driven by your own conscience your own knowledge, understanding of issues. Nothing stops you to go to Basse and consult people, to yes. go to Farafenya and consult people, yes. to go to Banjul and consult people as yes. a nominated member, to go and talk to different categories of our population. You know, for example, we know the Christians uh, have issues with the constitution. If I nominated a member, did you take time to go and meet the uh, Christian council to understand their issues and concerns? And then come and raise it at the... Uh, and come and raise it, yeah. You know, if you are a minority member, that, that is what I expect you to do if you cannot on your own be driven by your own conscience and your own understanding of national interest. Mm -hmm. But you did not do that. Yet you can have the audacity to stand, you know, in our national <laughs> bantaba yeah. and, and speak, make our land this claims. Now, now uh, one thing that you've also advocated for was the fact that, well, it has been rejected and you advocated for the blockade, if you like, of state house. What are you exactly talking about? People no, say Mali is always, no, I, I, always quick to rush into protest. Yeah, rush yeah, into, yeah, yeah, because into pro protest, protest is the lifeblood of democracy, of good governance. Whether governors know it or not, whether they want it or not, progress in a democracy does not happen. Democracy does not operate in a republic until citizens protest. Mm -hmm. The evidence is there even in the Gambia. Protest is what gave us independence. Edward Francis Small, in 1919, stood up to protest against the way colonialists were treating our people in Balangar. And since then, the man could never rest. And that is what generated until we get independence. In the course of the 22 years of dictatorship in this country, we saw our students protest against the raping of a schoolgirl and the killing of a schoolboy. It was, I mean, protest by people like Dera Hydra through writing to show disagreement, to disapprove that he had to be killed. The stories are too many. It was protest that uh, Solo Sandel led that eventually galvanized all of this movement to see uh, which um, uh, succeeded on t December 1st, 2016. So anybody who doesn't understand democracy is one who would have doubts about protest much more condemn it. I have said this so many it places. it is a matter of igno being ignorant. I ignorance, yeah. Mm. I have said this many places. Uh, democracy is not given to the people by the president, or by the speaker, or by the chief justice, or by the IGP, or by a minister. Go to America, United States of America, or France, or Sweden, advanced countries, democracies like that. Yes. Read their history from the beginning until today. The people who give democracy, who deliver democracy, who maintain uh, good governance mm -hmm. are the citizens. Mm -hmm. Not by sitting at home, but by coming out. Because, you see what I mean? One thing our people don't understand uh, politics without risks uh, there will be no accountability, there will be no transparency, there will be no justice. Until we make our politicians face risk for their decisions and actions, they will not act. So right now, our people should have been protesting at the massive corruption in this country. And this is what we see all around us and around the world. As I said at the beginning, right now, people of Cyprus are standing before their parliament against corruption. You go to Israel, what happened in Mali? You go to Nigeria, for seven days now, citizens are there standing against police brutality to the point that they had to ban that anti-crime unit in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, the, the SARS. Yeah, the SARS. So, so, <laughs> Lamin, so, if the people of Nigeria the don't do that, SARS will never be banned. And the examples are many. In France, an advanced country like that, people put on yellow vests for one year 
they stood up and made President Macron withdraw from a lot of decisions they wanted to take. Not to talk of Hong Kong. So, Gambia is not a special country. We are not in another planet. We are on this earth. And this democracy is the same democracy everywhere. But a lot of people find your, you, you know, this call for people to yeah, go so, to so this call, now. yes. So, uh, so, so I feel, yes, yes, la la yeah, it would be laughable because... Uh, the, the people say they oh Madi Westfield Jobate. Yeah, yeah. So, Madi, so, Madi so, so anytime you hear Madi Westfield Jobate, know that these are individuals who want to perpetuate bad leadership, yes. you know, bad governance in our country right now. People who are defenders of dictatorship. That the people calling me uh, Madi Westfield, which I which I, I love. Yeah, I love. At least it will be said there's one Gambian who does not agree to bad governance, bad leadership, mm -hmm. corruption, mm -hmm. who wants to stand up for good governance and democracy. So I love the name, True. Madi Westfield. All right? Maybe they should add it to Madi uh, Makati Maka Square. Maka yeah, I understand. Maka but um, what I was calling, and I have told this to our civil society, we had meetings, mm -hmm. that look, if I, I wish I had the power that what can call 100,000 Gambians, the day the speaker, that very moment said this bill is dead. That is the very moment all Gambians would should have, have risen have taken, taken to, this to march to Magali Square, occupy Bible, until the, the, the government corrects this mess. That is what we should, have, we should have done. Yeah, Because otherwise, what is the legitimacy of this government? What is the legitimacy of uh, those National Assembly members to con who voted no to continue to hold their seats? When we said... As a coalition government, I mean, of parties and people behind them, that we want to end dictatorship and create system change. And to create that system change, the institutional and I mean, legal reforms, the foundation of it is a new constitution. So if you kill that constitution, then it means there's no more system change, there's no more institutional reform, there's no more legal reform. Then what is the difference between that and the dictatorship when we are, when, 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 on, in, in which we were? Because the institutions remain the same. You know, they have not been reformed. The public service, the security sector, they are the same. So if you don't change that, then you are still under dictatorship. If the laws remain the same, the institutions remain the same, the uh, culture in the public service remain the same. This is why this corruption is coming out. This is why public services are, are in poor shape. So, what is the point? And in the next moment, what you're going to have is abuse of rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, this but is why you can have, I mean, an anti-crime unit who are there, you know, I mean, uh, brutalizing our, our youth. Because there's no system change. But the foundation of that system change, but, the model of that well, system well, change. You mentioned the anti-crime, and the problem I have with that has to do with the National Human Rights Commission. You have a whole National Human Rights Commission. Your investigation found that a top police officer brutalized a citizen the only thing you could do is to seek for the transfer of such an officer um, uh, unfortunate um you know um uh, how do i call this um well to be fair to them first of all the national human rights commission said it was a panel um, which comprised tango and the association and the police and the whole idea of the investigation was triggered by the police but then for me for a body like that to sit to look at a clear case of police brutality because me as a citizen right now you as a citizen if i should knock you right now i should not be transferred i should be i have broken law because i have injured your your person so i should be held accountable for that so it is even more serious if I'm a public officer to hit a citizen. It's not justified in any way. So for me, for that body to sit down, to look at this clear case of abuse of power, and only to reward the perpetrator. Because for me, what happened is a reward. That perpetrator is travesty of you know, unimaginable proportion. And I am so disappointed, and I hereby call on uh, the National Human Rights Commission, the Gambia Association, and Tango, and the police themselves to get back 
to reverse that decision, to withdraw their report. That is what I would demand of them. But failing that, I'm demanding that the president uh, not only uh, ensure that uh, Gorgon Boop faces justice and accountability, but that that anti-crime unit needs to be disbanded so that we create a proper structure on very strong uh, values and standards for human rights in law enforcement, um, equip them with the necessary resources uh, so that they will be able to combat crime in this country. All right? Uh, when we say these things, a lot of our citizens uh, do not seem to see the bigger picture, that just remove the bad ones. No. That institution is infested yes. with a bad culture. Yes. All right? You need to send a message to all other units across the security sector yes. that uh, torture, police brutality will not be tolerated. Action will be taken. So the Nigerians, what they have done, all right? They disbanded SARS, redeployed all officers to other units, but also opened investigations for any SARS officer who is found to have engaged in torture to be put to justice. To be held to account. To be held accountable. That is what a serious government society does. So what we need, all right? And mind you, in the Gambia, anti-crime unit is only one unit located in one place, in Koto. In Nigeria, the SARS is present in all the 36 states of Nigeria. So even in effective uh, crime crime combating crime, and the crime unit is, is, as it is presently constituted, is really inadequate in every way you can imagine. Personnel, resources, equipment, whatever. It's inadequate. So if you're even serious for uh, law enforcement, I mean to combat crime in this country, and the crime unit needs to be reviewed, even as it is. All right? But then must also have to realize that the basis for law enforcement for combating crime is not an anti-crime unit, it's the police station. The police station is the basic police unit in our communities. All right? So what we need to demand is urgent police reforms so that we begin to look at the police stations and most of police stations are present across the country. What are the requirements for police stations? A standard police station, what should it have? Should they have a vehicle? How many vehicles? How many officers? What kind of equipment they should have? I mean, uh, tools, right? from guns to computers to, I mean, uh, motorbikes to bicycles. I mean, you really yeah. review the entire police station yes. to see, okay, what is a standard police station? Yes. And what kind of community deserves a police station? All right? So that um, a community of 10 villages, do they deserve a police station? All right? Uh, a community of 300,000 people like Serakunda, how many police stations do they deserve? deserve? Does any every community deserve, I mean, neighborhood deserves a police station? So police reform should look at all of those things so that you create a standard structure no. for law enforcement. Then uh, units like anti-crime units, you see, like if you go to any security outfit, whether it's the military or the police or even the intelligence, they have specialized units. Specialized units. Specialized in certain kinds of issues, say crime, right. a certain kind of targets, all right? Operations. Operations. They don't do everyday routine thing. That's for the police station. So if you are serious about combating crime, the current anti-crime unit is inadequate, it's unfit to combat crime in this country. And then when you do all of those reforms, you create a proper accountability structure. A reporting process. For example, walk down to Sarakunda Police Station today and tell them from January to uh, in October, yes. how many cases of gender-based violence have you received here? How many cases of child sex crimes have you received here? How many cases of uh, um, theft, for example, yes. armed robbery have you received here? You understand? Uh, do they have a computer system at Sarakunda Police Station, at Brikama Police Station? in Bakao Police Station, at Basai Police Station, mm -hmm. so that they are capturing all of these reports, yes. so that at the end of the day, you go to the police headquarters, they can, in one 
hit of the button produce to you the various the you know list of statistics of crimes mm -hmm. in this country and then you know not just the crimes because anti-crime unit you know you hear people here yeah, because people are overwhelmed with the crime in the country forgetting still you have anti-crime unit you are still complaining of crime so you, you don't even have the good sense to say okay then something must be wrong if you feel we should not disband anti-crime unit yet crime is very prevalent so what are they doing it? All right? How many cases have anti-crime unit prosecuted, for example? The police, how many cases have they prosecuted? So that you look at those prosecutions, how many convictions did they have and how many did they not have convictions because they have no evidence. Now, they may not have evidence, they may not prosecute well. It may be an issue of capacity because they don't have the tools. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we make sure we equip the police with the necessary tools so that they can investigate any case and get competent evidence and go to court and get the perpetrator convicted. You see, we got see, to be serious in this country. Yeah, I mean, these yeah. cosmetic things people are engaged with, it's not going to help this country. We, we got to be serious. The RGP needs to lead robust police reforms. You need that at the intelligence, at the prisons, all right, in the military. Yes. But until today, yes. I mean, uh, no security institutions has their law been taken to the National Assembly for review. The Police Act, mm -hmm. it needs to be reviewed. Why is it not done for years down the line? The NIA Act needs to be reviewed. But look, the audacity that they have to call the NIA SIS. The Constitution does not know SIS. The NIA Act does not know SIS. Because God, the name okay. there the is National the Intelligence the Agency. But you will see, ordinary governments like you and me, continue to buy that kind of crazy idea to call NIA SIS. Then that was, is perpetuation was, of fact, abuse of the, the rule not, of law because that's an illegal name. That's an illegal name. Why should we call NIA, NIA SIS? When, when that's not That's the, not the name. No, it's illegal the name. It's, it's NIA. All right? You go to prisons. I was in a committee to review the Prison Act. We completed our job since 2018. The comprehensive review of the, uh, of the Prisons Act visited my two, uh, visited Joshua prisons, yes. in and out. Until today, that bill that we reviewed has not gone to the National Assembly. I was involved also Thank in you. the review of the Drug Control Act. Until today, the Drug Control Act has not gone to the National Assembly. It's sitting in one office. It, it is sitting picking, down picking, there. Picking, so picking, so picking, all picking of that indicates off. you have a government that is not interested in institutional you know, reforms in legal reforms. And the model of that process is the constitution. So now that we don't even have a new constitution, because you would imagine if you have a new constitution that has set high standards, high values, now we can review all of these laws and make them in line with that new constitution. Now that we don't have that new constitution, all those laws, there's no point, because they are all aligning with the 1997 constitution. Of course, but one thing, let, let, let's come a little bit back, finally, finally, before we wrap up, uh, you know, has to do with the, 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 the Minister of Justice, while well, the government, while well, the executive, if you like, trying to bring back the draft, that's what they are, I mean, up to, that is the plan that they are hatching uh, to kind of find a way of bringing it back to the National Assembly and this time it getting passed. But they are doing this by way of you know setting up an independent body what body is this really i have no i don't know this is a body that is however going to be different from the body that is you know uh, legally you know accepted that is the uh, crc to spearhead this effort you, what, what does that make sense to you yeah it, it makes sense the crc act requires that it dissolves one month after the draft is being presented to the parliament. Yes. So I would expect the CRC should be wrapping up in this October. And, and they wrap up. And that's the end of the CRC. But nothing stops the government from initiating any process and building any institution um, for the purpose of drafting a new constitution. And that process, there are multiple options. Um, I wish the National Assembly members and the Minister of Justice particularly, in drafting the CRC bill, they had consulted um, particular lessons from the uh, constitution review process of mm -hmm. Kenya, mm -hmm. all right, um, which would have addressed 
uh, the situation we have. All right. Um, but nothing stops them from doing that. From today going onward, the president can set up a process and it will be subjected to scrutiny uh, to, because it got to be legitimate and got to be legal uh, um, to set up that body or whatever it is uh, to begin that writing that pro constitution. Even though uh, that would pain my heart so much because we don't need to do that because it means we are throwing away $116 million down the drain. It means we are throwing a great resource away. No, no, I think it, I think what they want to do is just to, it is this same draft that they are going to walk by. They will just find a way, they, they, the independent body will just find a way of, yeah, yeah, you know, striking yeah. consensus uh, among the uh, different... Uh, 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 I know, but what I'm saying, to, to do that still, it means you have already wasted $160 million. Yes. That is unforgivable and somebody must pay that price. <laughs> Who should pay that price? The, the, president the president should pay that. The that is why I'm power. saying... I wish Gandhians I have the power to pick 100,000 Gandhians and, and, them to and, 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 and demand that but they, if they do that, you are going to give the problem uh, a problem. If 100,000 Gandhians to take them to Makati Square, that would be really a problem. But I'm not what what sure. kind of problem? I'm not even sure. I, I mean, that, that might even lead to his defenestration, his collapse. So as leader of this if the government collapses, that, 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 so, that is not I'm not strange. even sure. The police will allow you guys to get to Denton Bridge. <laughs> well, you, you know, <laughs> which, which shows all the more the undemocratic nature <laughs> of this government. Yeah, all right, yeah. but the point is that is what we should have done as citizens. You know, to make sure that their decisions face consequence. Yes. All right, but this initiative they are trying to do, we, we will see because at the end of the day, Lamin, there are uh, basic democratic values and standards for a republic that we should not compromise all right um there are best practices in democracy yes. that we should uphold mm -hmm. like time limits two times ten years i don't i would not support any gambian to serve for more than 10 years in total so whatever they want to do with this current draft fine but we we will have to see that draft that it meets basic democratic and republican uh, standards and values because this country is our country. We cannot draft a constitution to suit the selfish political objective of one individual or one group. You know? So whatever they wish to do is a school. But then, as I said, um, the, the values and the standards are there. That is not to say um, a constitution is necessarily perfect. All right? But some basic values need to be maintained. Yeah. Uh, before I go, I, I almost forgot about it. I mean, you attended this this event earlier today, uh, the Commission on Political Debates, that's the commission in the Gambia that is trying to promote the culture of debate in the Gambia. We have seen what uh, the U.S. is doing, uh, their elections is coming uh, next month. Uh, we've seen their political leader, well, candidates, um, you know, debating. And this is something that we have uh, our own political commission that is trying to come with something like, what do you have uh, to say about the issue of debate? In a, in, a, in a society such as ours? Uh, very good. Uh, both for the citizen, but also for the candidates. Because for the candidates, it gives you that opportunity uh, to now face the people in a very civilized, organized, in a very, you know, without all the fanfare, to explain yourself better. Um, not for your supporters, because maybe your supporters, whatever they will be for you, but particularly for those that are your opponents who are undecided, who are not going to vote for you. So a political debate is very good. And every political candidate, all right, from president to local councils, you should welcome political debate. If you really think that uh, you have national interests as heart, you have a vision, you have an agenda, a program that is good for the people, you should be able to come and sell it to the people. So it is very good. But also for the citizens, it is good because... Um, you know, when political parties or candidates organize rallies, usually rallies is a bunch of fanfare, yeah, a bunch of rhetorics, you know, all sorts of statements. I mean, foul language, in fact, you know, even hate speech. So usually political rallies, a lot of sense doesn't come out. People storm the place and the, the whole time they don't even listen. And I'm not sure there is any accountability at all. Because yeah. if it is in a debate, you will be prepared. You will know that uh, uh, there is a journalist that is going to ask me serious questions. And yeah. if I lie so, or if I mislead hmm. it, yes. So, so that, that, what that does is it makes you fine-tune 
your ideas, your agenda, your policy. So that is all good for the candidate. But for the citizen also, um, you know, I may not go to a rally. But that debate is a good source of information for me to begin to understand what candidate A wants or B and so on. All right? Um, because um, uh, apart from all of that, um, it brings sanity uh, to our politics. Yeah. You know, in America, one thing I like about the presidential debates, they have this practice called fact check. They fact check. Because politicians, I can sit here and, and say a lot of bombs. But, you know, if there's somebody doing fact checking to see whether the statements, the figures, the quotes I'm making are really true, you know, that is also good for citizens. So um, you begin to even get to the, 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 the track record, you know, the integrity of the candidate. And all of these are issues that should interest citizens. So I therefore support uh, the... Uh, culture of political debates, which actually we started that here in 2013 at Tango, we uh, conceived of a, a mayoral debate in Banjo, you know, for the 2013 local government elections, and for a mayoral debate in Calife municipality, but on, on the radio. So, but the, when we initiated it, we got support, BCC gave us good support at that time. Yeah, they are very happy. In fact, we were supposed to host the uh, debate at Gambia High School Hall, but they said, no, this is about Banjul. All right? Banjul mayors seeking the votes of Banjul citizens mm -hmm. come to BCC Hall. That is the home of Banjul. So it was great. We did a serious mobilization. I mean, a lot of media, I remember a lot of radio stations came to me that they want to carry the debate live. So it was going to be historic. But Lamin, when we got to that day in Banjul, and the hall was building up, people are coming. 13 minutes to the start of the debate, the BCC security came and said, we should leave the hall because there are instructions to close the hall. And I told them, but why? We couldn't see the mayor, we couldn't see the CEO, try to call their numbers, nobody could see. All of a sudden, uh, a truckload of paramilitary, you know, riot police appeared, and we were pushed out of the hall. And that was the end of that. So, but since then, uh, there have been debates. I think 2016, 2018, yes. parliamentary elections, there was some debate. And now a whole body is being constituted uh, called the Commission on Political Debates, you know, led by a very energetic young man, uh, Bakari Fati, yes. um, which is now being commissioned. So I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy uh, we are having this because this is the way and uh, we are going to enhance, improve our democracy and good governance. So, uh, and which highlights also the role of civil society. This is the role civil society should play. Um, the, the first televised political debate in the United States was in 1960. You know, John F. Kennedy and I think uh, President Nixon. Nixon right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, it, it changed the entire political landscape to today what is happening, you know, in America. So it's, it's great Ghana started, you know, late but better late than never the, 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 ghana is doing it sierra leone is doing it nigeria is it in our environment do you think president Barrow will be open to that idea at all of debating then I, debate? I i i hope he will not be yeah Jeremy, because when our debate was closed in 20 cancelled in 2013 when we tried to find out the indication we have is uh jana wasn't amenable to that idea because of course when we organize that our target is to have the next presidential debate uh, uh, when the elections come in 2016. Mm -hmm. So before we get there, he decided to cut it off. All right? But as we said, the benefits of this debate for a candidate. So I would say, uh, I will encourage Barrow to take part. Yes. Um, maybe now is the time for him to begin to fine tune his ideas, for him to, you know, get his people to prepare his agenda so that, you know, to practice. Because debate, you know, is, is also practice. You don't read a paper. <laughs> you know, it is not, a, a, you know, a political rally. You know, uh, you know, Alma Molling, Al Karum Balbe Kondona, Musolning Kolbe, Balbe Kondona. No, no. It's not that. It's serious talk, yeah? So, 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 so maybe it's the time for him to begin to prepare himself. As the leader of this country, who's led this country for five years, he should have a lot to say, yeah? Um, a lot to defend, a lot to justify. All right. So I would encourage him and his people to begin to prepare him. 
you know but to uh, decide not to take part for me it would in indicate not just incompetence but also a total disrespect to Gambian voters it shows bad leadership that he doesn't want to be held accountable uh, for his um, leadership and that would be tragic for him and for the Gambia so my advice to him and his team is uh, prepare yourselves but for all the other political leaders prepare yourselves for the presidential debates in 2021 but also for you people the media to prepare yourselves to give this good coverage on television and radio on our newspapers not just to cover it but to go behind the scenes to bring the track record you know to bring issues around the candidates um you know based on issues not personality things or family things anything much slinging no serious issues for the consideration of voters but also during the debate as i said fact check it so i would expect after each debate you know news review would sit here mm -hmm. and fact check what did you know candidate a say candidate b i mean how does that link to the facts is it true or false mm -hmm. yeah so that voters know uh this debate last night the candidates 99 percent of what they said is all lies mm -hmm or you know it's all true or so we, we saw the biden trump debate the cnn did a, a beautiful fact checking and it is amazing how many lies were spread in the debate particularly <laughs> yeah. by trump you know you know i'm covering the elections this year yeah. and uh, i think I, that was at some point i was asking you to give me a comment regarding that debate. but aside debate what do you think uh, i know every society has its well country has its challenges unique to them but but there are good you know stuff that we can always learn from each other what are some of the things aside their coming election is fast approaching what are some of the things that the gambia can learn since we are also going into elections next year some of the things that we can learn as a country from america aside debate yeah apart from the debate i think what we can learn from them is the uh, to be amenable to divergent and dissenting opinion um you know um there are sort of uh trash in america also though there are a lot of things you need to avoid mm -hmm. um in their politics uh, because there's a lot of um, hate speech and uh, bigotry and all of that in the politics so we should learn to avoid that and to cleanse our own politics so that it is based on issues all right but at the same time even if it is based on issues let, let us be prepared to um accept divergent and dissenting opinion so we can disagree uh, without having to insult and all of those things that Gambians do. Um, I, I think that Gambians generally we, we, we don't accept criticism. Yes, we don't uh, uh, accept divergent or dissenting opinion. All right, uh, and and that is something that we need to learn, you know, from from America uh, and other places um, as well as I said. Also, avoid a lot of the. Um, you know bad politics that is very prevalent in america uh, as well or other than that it is for civil society and the media to also learn from the media uh, in the united states i mean i, I like the, uh, the the media houses uh, whether it's cnn or msnbc or, or fox news or so i mean how they would you know really um create panels to scrutinize uh, the, the the politicians the parties their agenda their issues and the things that they say so it, it is important our uh, media just don't be reporting um you know what happened mm -hmm. but to have the to create the environment where we you know sit down to scrutinize i mean by not just bringing uh so-called presidential advisors here <laughs> and other politicians eh? yeah. but to bring experts so that i mean what in terms of health why the health experts to speak to the uh, political uh, agenda of politicians uh, in regard to health or in regard to agriculture or about climate change or i mean education um you know about women about children about crime you know we have security experts who can speak to the you know agenda of politicians or political parties about crime so uh, our media should help you know to make sure citizens are getting um proper information good analysis you know away and above uh, all of the rhetoric that comes from politicians and their supporters. Yeah, so this is something that we can learn uh, from them. And of course, for civil society, is to get involved. 
uh, not just organized debates, but um, uh, political monitoring is very advanced in America. Uh, like right now, there are a number of uh, civil society organizations that are monitoring political parties. You know, uh, how many times they appear on media, uh, what are the issues they talk about, uh, or, they, or they don't talk about, uh, what practices are they involved in? I mean, to uh, check, you know, are they engaged in, you know, malpractices or, you know, uh, electoral malpractices generally? You know, so that all of these reports uh, come out. So we need our political parties, I mean, uh, our civil society organizations to also get engaged, you know, to get all of these things for, for our public to know. Yeah. Mr. Javada, yeah. thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. So that will be it for today's show. Um, Mahdi Javada was my guest today. Thank you.